those that are watching online today. Let's go back over to Galatians chapter, four, chapter five. That's where we're gonna be, Galatians five. And um, how many of you have heard of or know Eliud Kipju? All right, right here. All right, you don't have to answer, okay? But some of you are like, Eliud, okay, was that like a minor prophet or something in the Old Testament? No, Eliud Kipju, he did something, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name, so I apologize if I am, but he did something two years ago that nobody thought was possible. That is, that he broke the world record for the marathon. First man ever to run a marathon, 26.2 miles, in, in, under two, in under two hours. So one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds, and he broke the world record. And it's really amazing just to think about, I don't know if you, we have any marathoners here, anybody ever ran, ran a marathon, but it's a long way. Um, it's about from here to Molino or almost to Navarre, so that's a long way to run. Uh, it's a long way to drive to Molino. Would you agree with that, all right? But, but to run is really amazing. So I want you to think about the pace that he had to keep to run 26.2 miles in, in under two hours. And it's, it's just a little bit over four minutes. It's four minutes and 30 seconds, a four minute and 30 second pace mile for 26 miles. Okay, now it, it's amazing to think about that because it wasn't that long ago where, you know, they were trying really hard to break the four minutes in one mile. So it was, wasn't long ago that that was actually a really fast pace for one mile, but he did it for 26 miles. And, uh, and I started thinking about it. How many of you know that, that he didn't just show up and, and try to run the world record marathon? That, it, that he didn't just decide one day that, you know, I think I'll give it my best shot and see what happens. I mean, there's a lot behind the scenes that goes into accomplishing something like that. Of course, he trains for decades. If you're kind of a runner like that, everything in your life revolves around that. Uh, but there, there's also, it's very interesting, this, the process that he went through. It was a unique race in that he, he wore uh, never used, before used high performance equipment. So he had shoes that people thought actually is cheating the system, that it gives him an unfair advantage. And, um, and he also, he didn't run alone either. Though he's the only guy on the finish line, he actually had quite a bit of help. He had 36 pace setters. Okay, and there's a picture of him right here, I think. 36 pace setters that ran with him along the way. And in fact, the pace setters that were running with him, they're, they're world-class runners themselves. And so their job, I love that formation, is basically to stay in front of him, to protect him from, any, from the resistance of the wind. So they're drafting. And so they would, they would change formations and new people would get in so that they could protect him. So in many ways, what it meant to run the marathon was actually running behind somebody. And it's more than that, they actually had a pace car as well. So there's a car just out of view. In fact, there's a, another picture of it. There's a car right in front of them. And the car that's driving in front of them is to precisely uh, move at the exact speed that's required for him to break the two hour marathon. And so he didn't have to check the time. He didn't have to find out what, where he was. Should he speed up? Should he slow down? It was already determined for him. And they took it a step further. As you notice, there's a laser beam, all right? And the laser literally is meant to show him the precise place he's supposed to be running at. So his job is not to try to figure out the pace, to try to figure out how fast or how slow he could and should run. His job is to find that mark made by that laser and to just assume the right position and the pace setting car, if he just follows that path and he follows and he stays on that course, he will get what he wants. And I think it's an amazing picture. And I want us to think about that image right there as we just consider this thing we've been talking about the last couple of weeks where we're all called to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that our job, if you will, is to find out what God says and what he desires for us and to find our mark on the ground. We don't have to worry about where we're going. We don't have to worry about how hard we run or how slow we go. We just find that place on the ground and we stick with it that we follow his lead. 
And that ultimately is what Galatians chapter five is all about. We've started the series in the series, Heroes and Villains, really looking at the book of Galatians and how Paul wrote that, that there's a life that, 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 that the spirit desires or that God desires, but then there's another makeup, another nature that we have where it's more of a fleshy desire. And these things are at odds with each other. And, you know, it's an interesting thing because we're either gonna allow our, our feelings, our experiences, our desires, our perspective, our knowledge, and our experiences guide us, or we're gonna be guided by the Holy Spirit. And that's ultimately the tension that he's, he's wrestling with. And it's just much safer to allow the Holy Spirit to lead our lives. And when the Holy Spirit leads our life, he leads us into something that we all want. The Bible calls it freedom. And in Galatians chapter five, it speaks about freedom. And freedom is a central value in the scripture. It's what happens when you and I find our mark and we follow God in the life that he has for us. But of course, our challenge is that the Bible values freedom. We also live in a culture that values freedom. And sometimes the definition of our culture and the definition the scripture gives are at odds with each other. I mean, we're in America. Come on, we love some freedom around here, all right? And to us, freedom equates with independence. And, you know, no one telling me what to do. I can determine my own, my own life. I can choose my own path. You know, no one's gonna control me. And that's a, that's a good posture to have, I believe, and a good position for the government to have in our life and the place that we live. But that's not biblical freedom and it's not what true freedom is really meant. Uh, that though God gives us freedom, in fact, Galatians chapter five in verse 14, Paul says, for you have been called to live in freedom. So it's not just an idea. You're called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but notice this, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. He's saying you've been set free. Nobody can control you. Nobody's gonna force you to do anything, but you do have a choice to make. What will you do with that freedom? And that means for us that we can, we're free to do anything we wanna do, but that doesn't mean that we're free from the consequences of anything we wanna do. And what God is really inviting us into is a life of freedom that oftentimes for us feels restrictive. But here's the deal, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to freedom, freedom is not the absence of restraints, it's the presence of the right type of restraint. And that's when he goes on to say, use your freedom not to indulge your sinful nature, but rather to serve other people. Which is interesting because it seems like if I'm your servant, that means that you're oppressing me and that I belong to you in that way. In fact, the language is one of slavery. Like I'm now your slave, you're in charge of me. I'm second fiddle, I'm second class. Whatever you need, that's what I'm gonna do. How many know that doesn't sound like freedom sometimes? But what God is inviting us to is something that we wouldn't always conclude, but he's inviting us to live in such a way and experience life on that mark in the ground that we will flourish into the, into the life that he's called us to do. But that doesn't mean it's free for all and chaotic. I mean, know that freedom is really determined by the environment that we're designed to, to experience that freedom. I mean, know that a bird underwater is not free. Right? I mean, know that a fish on the beach is not free. He's free from any restraint, but that doesn't mean that that's the best place for him. And this is a good understanding for us as we approach Galatians chapter five and this tension that Paul says we're all in. Every one of us have impulses that lead us towards the flesh, that indulge, the indulgent part of ourselves, and also these desires the spirit has. And he says, these two things are at constant conflict or they're fighting constantly. And he says, here's how, you, here's how you say no to your flesh. And that is by allowing the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit leads your life, you will not indulge your sinful nature. And he says, when you came to Christ, you took all your passions and all your desires and you crucified them there with Jesus on the cross. And now it says, now you belong to him. And then life starts changing. So really this series is about understanding the tension that's on the inside of us. There's a battle happening in all of our lives. Which direction will we go? And then we go to Galatians chapter six. So flip the page over in Galatians chapter six if you have a Bible. And let me just say this, all right? The chapters and verses in the Bible were not put there by God, okay? Okay, when Paul was writing this and when the writers were writing it, it wasn't here, okay, this is chapter three. Okay, this is, this, is, this is a new verse, this is a new thought. No, just so you know, chapter five and chapter six is a continuation of the same thought. 
Okay, so he's not starting a new subject. This isn't like, okay, we'll pick up this later. No, this is continued, okay? So I want us to notice this because what we're gonna see, if we just think about the mark that's on the ground, that if we don't have a mark to, to find our, our positioning with, then we're going to be led astray or led into all kinds of things. And there's safety in finding God's place in the path that he has for us. And if we don't have that, then we're going to wind up in places probably none of us want to be. And the Bible calls that being led astray. Okay, we're led. I mean, we're, it's hard to stay on that mark. Sometimes we're tracked to go here, to go do different things. And the word for being led astray is the, is the concept I want to talk about today. And that is deception. Deception. To be deceived means to be led astray. And if we don't have a mark on the ground to position ourselves to, then we're gonna be led astray. And so this is what it says in Galatians chapter six, verse one. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the spirit, okay, he's gonna go back. He's gonna say that you who live by the spirit, you who are led by the spirit should restore that person how? Gently. But watch yourselves. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. But each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load, but nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Verse seven, notice this. Do not be, everybody say it. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or a woman, a human being reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction, but whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. It's a heavy, significant text. We're gonna talk about deception, but let me just mention this at the beginning. It talks about if someone, if a friend, if a person is caught in sin, meaning they're exposed to be somebody that you didn't know they were, or something that, that they do, their, their character and their integrity is compromised. Or maybe you find something that's hurtful or you were betrayed or you were hurt by somebody else and it was found out, okay? How many have ever had an experience like that? Anybody ever had an experience like that? Okay, we all have. And it, it's in those moments, I believe that more than any other time in our life, do we need to make sure that we're led by the spirit of God and not how we feel. Because it's so easy to be led by emotions, by our feelings, even our pride, by our hurt, instead to respond gently to make sure that restoration can take place, okay? That's a different subject we're gonna get to. But today I wanna, I wanna, look, at, I wanna look at deception and specifically how to safeguard ourselves from going astray. And this is very important, especially in this theme we've been in with heroes and villains. If you think about our popular villains, many of them are not the sick, sadistic, bloodthirsty, you know, narcissistic, crazy. Oftentimes, they're normal people, even decent people who have been misled. In fact, if you think about many of the hero and villain stories, what you'll oftentimes find is this, and that is that the villain is usually convinced that they're the hero. The villain is usually convinced that they're the hero. You see, deception and delusion go hand in hand. And that's really the problem and the challenge that we're gonna look at. So we're gonna look at a popular villain story. It's one of my favorites from the Avengers and it's Thanos and look at his experience as a villain. The villain usually thinks they're the hero. You know, Thanos is a classic story, thought that what he was doing was right and justified because he believed the lie. And if you look at the Bible, there's many bad guys, if you will. There's lots of people that got off track, that were led astray, that were villains, all right? And many of them were convinced that what they were doing was necessary, right? Judas is a classic villain, but he thought what, it was, what he was doing was right. Saul, you know, he was driven by envy and jealousy, but he thought what he was doing was right. Jezebel, same thing. Pilate thought he was doing the right thing. 
And in a strange twist, when you read the gospels, when Jesus shows up on the scene, and as you go through the scripture and you see his story and what happens in his life, it's amazing the twist that happens along the way. The surprise of the gospels is who actually became the villain. And of course, you know, if you, you, don't have, you can pretty much read any page of the gospel. And what you'll find is that the people persecuting Jesus throughout the gospels were the people that you thought would be with them when he showed up. But instead, they're criticizing and persecuting him. You know, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the people that were most devoted to God, were committed to the scripture, dedicated to serving God, committed to the law like nobody else. And yet when God sends his son here, they become the one that persecutes, criticizes, and in many places tried to kill Jesus. And eventually they succeeded in doing it. Who would have thought of been the pastors? the leaders of the church that would, that would go astray. Amazing to think about. Then of course, let's think about this. Other than Jesus, who is the hero of the New Testament? Okay, Paul, right? Paul's a good one. Paul wrote, if you get past the gospels, Paul wrote pretty much every book of the Bible that you see beyond that point. Amazing guy. Okay, but think about the first time we met Paul. We met Paul and his name was Saul. And Saul was a Pharisee of Pharisees from the tribe of Benjamin, highly devoted and zealous. And when we meet Paul, the guy that wrote most of our New Testament, when we meet him, his name is is Saul. And the book of Acts records the the early church's experience with this Paul. And it says that Paul punished Christians in the synagogue, that he voted voted, uh, for, for Christians to be killed, that he worked to try to get Christians to blaspheme, and that he was there in the very first martyr that happened in the in the early church with the stoning of Stephen. This is the same Paul that all of us go, we love Paul. You know, <laughs> think about all the stuff that he's done. Saul. He's the bad guy. And then, of course, in Acts chapter 9, on the way to Damascus, he's on his donkey, and the Lord knocks him off his donkey, blinds him, speaks to him, and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says that, and that's interesting, but here's the thing you have to understand about Saul, the thing you have to understand about the Pharisees and what they did. They were convinced that what they were doing was right, that it was necessary, that it was needed. They were convinced. Paul was sincere that not only did he think what he was doing and persecuting people and trying to get them to turn away from their faith, making their life difficult, he thought that by doing that, not only was it the right thing, but he thought he was serving God in doing so. And he says, why are you persecuting me? He's like, I didn't know I was persecuting you. And his whole life changes. He's now Paul, you're gonna be an apostle. And of course, now you can understand why there's such great reluctance from the early church leaders because you know, he was a religious terrorist. And he's now wanting to serve in a, and you know, have a, run a small group at the church, you know? <laughs> like, I'm not so sure you're, you're ready for that, right? And then he, his life has changed. He becomes a missionary. Now he's writing all these letters, many of which are our Bible. I just want you to think about whenever you read Paul's words, remember you're reading the words of a former religious terrorist and how Jesus has radically altered and changed his life. And when you begin to look at the people in your life and you think there's no way that they could ever come to Christ, there's no way that they could ever know Jesus, think about the words that we read and the person that was altered and was changed. Many of us don't even think about Saul that way. So I want you to think about Saul and what God did in his life and where he brought him from. How many are grateful that we're not who we once were? Can I tell you something? There's people in this world that know a different Josh Lipscomb. People in my experience, in my past, in my encounters that don't know Pastor Josh, they just know a different Josh. And probably the same thing is true of you. How many are grateful that your reputation doesn't have to be your legacy? That the things that people know you about doesn't doesn't have to be the things you're known by. And Paul's a great example of that. That he changes and he transforms his life with blinders on and now he can see. And now in Ephesians chapter four, let's go over that. Let's look at this, the words of a former religious terrorist. 
He knows a thing or two about how you can get involved in stuff you shouldn't be involved in, but you didn't know any better and sincerely be misguided along the way. Ephesians 4, 17, he says, now I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Gentiles means people that don't have a relationship with God like us, okay? And the futility of their thinking. I want you to pick up on this. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in, in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now this word ignorance doesn't mean stupid. It just means they don't know what they don't know. It doesn't mean they're not smart. It's not looking down. It's just saying they're, they don't know what they don't know. They've been dark, they've have a, they have a darkened understanding. They're blind spiritually. They can't appreciate the things that you appreciate. They don't see the things that you see, okay? They've hardened their heart. And having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. They're just saying, if you don't have God, all you got is all the desires in your heart. Try to satisfy it as best you can, okay? Then he goes on, verse 20. That, however, is not the way of life you have learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with, and I want us to know this is an amazing, important phrase, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. He's saying your eyes were darkened as well. Now you can see. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. Everybody say my former way of life. Okay, before you met Jesus, there's a, there's a different way I lived. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being, I want you to notice this, if you've got a, a real Bible with paper and you've got a pen or a highlight, highlight this. If you've got a phone, highlight it in your phone, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. We're gonna come back to that. And to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holy, holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, don't live lies. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. What Paul is saying is there's an old self, there's an old way of life. Same way he was talking in, in Galatians, how we have this old man, this old nature, this old way of thinking. And we're gonna need a new way of living. We're gonna need a new way of thinking. And that doesn't come by accident. You're gonna have to put off the old, you're gonna have to put on the new. Meaning you're not just gonna be able to come to church and listen to a podcast and poof, the old man's gone, the new man is alive. There's, there's things that we have to do in order for it to see. And specifically, we have to identify our own tendencies. And he says, in the old way of life, we have deceitful desires that corrupts us. And that word corrupt means devastation is coming. Pain's coming. Danger is corruptible and Amazing one-two punch. Not only is your desires corruptible, causes problems in your life, but they also deceive you. They deceive you. And so what Paul is saying, if I could just sum it up, is that our desires are so ugly, they kill us while convincing us they give us life. They kill us while convincing us that they give us life. Okay, I wanted to talk about deception. And the first place I think we need to do is we need to line up with what Paul's saying and just say we're all prone to deception. And I wanna take it a step further and not only just say we're all prone to deception, myself included, I'm not wagging my finger at anybody, we're all prone to deception. We're all prone to, being, to going astray. But let's take it up a notch. And I think this is where we can actually fight this and find some safety in it, is that not only are we prone to deception, but I'm most likely deceived right now. And if we think that way, we can actually approach the truth. And in certain areas of our life, that's probably the case. And some of us may be like, well, there's no way I could be deceived. And I would say, if you feel that way, you already are deceived. Because the problem with deception, the big problem with deception is that the people that are deceived are convinced that they are right. You don't become, you know, disingenuous. It's not that you're disingenuous, you're sincere. That's what Paul was, but you're misguided. And a delusion is there. That's why in Galatians 6 says, watch yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, watch yourself. 
You gotta watch yourself. When you look around at other people, it says, watch yourself, examine yourself. Think about you before you presume about them. Proverbs, book of Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. There's a way that seems right. Everybody told me this is okay. This is the right way to go. I should go this. I feels right. It feels good. But hey, you know, I don't know where this is headed. You know, look for that laser pointer on the ground and stay right there where it is. And if we're going to examine ourselves, I think it's a thing that we need to do consistently in our life. Okay. Just a few simple things that are centered around finding safety in the middle of the deception that's so easy for us to to uh, get, get snagged in, is if we're gonna examine ourselves, we need to have the standard that we're, we need to have the right standard to look to. And I think Paul summed it up by saying, Jesus is the truth, okay? We know the, and understand the way of life, Jesus is the truth. So let me say it this way, that Jesus is the standard of truth. Jesus is the standard of truth. I don't ha- you don't have your truth and I don't have my truth, they're just the truth. You don't have your way and I have my way. No, no, there's just the way. And your way may lead here and my way may lead there. But ultimately, the destination determines whether or not it's the right way or not. Come on, somebody. All this stuff is happening. And what Jesus is saying, no, no, this is the way. There's a way that we're supposed to live our life. I know that way. And I'm not just saying, okay, read the words of Jesus and don't read anything. I'm saying when the Bible says that Jesus being the word that became flesh. And here's the deal. Let me just say, I love you. I care about you. But if you're a spiritual person and your spirituality isn't connected to God's word being the highest authority of your life, you're a lot of things, but you're not a Christian. I mean, I don't mean, I'm not saying that ugly. I'm saying it loving. I'm saying it caring. But if, if, if Christ and his work in our life, the gospel, the central to our soul being saved and the scripture being the foundation for our living and our choices, you may be spiritual, but you're not following Jesus. That's that pointer right there. I gotta find my point and I gotta get on it, right? That's all I gotta worry about. And I know this isn't easy, especially in the day in which we live in, because, you know, when Paul says it's controversial, your desires ain't good. Your desires ain't good. And you need a standard to look to. You know, when the scripture tells us something about my heart, not yours, my heart, my heart, the scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 17 that my heart is deceitful and wicked, that it's beyond cure, that there's something wrong in our desires that leads us to indulge at our expense. It sabotages ourself and we have to find something different. So what is that standard? You have to have a standard. And if your standard is your feeling or what everybody thinks, there's a good chance you're just gonna be all over the place. Jesus is a standard for our life. He's a standard of truth in our life. And here's, here's a second follow-up. And that is, when you think about a standard of make sure that I'm, I'm on the right path is, is the second question. I wanna ask you this question. That is, am I willing to be wrong? Am I willing to be wrong? Because I find oftentimes that's really the crux of the issue. I had a conversation with somebody that was wondering about why we did a certain thing at the church. And they said, well, why do you do this? I'm not sure about this. I'm not used to that. And I said, well, here's why we do it. Here's what the scripture says about it. And instantaneously, they responded and said, well, I don't care if the Bible says it. I don't like it. And I'm like, well, whoa, 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 time out. So the issue is not, this isn't the issue. There's a bigger issue at play here. Saying the only thing we do is is to be built upon the scripture as the foundation of our life and our truth. And whenever that becomes optional, everything is on the table. That's what this is about. And are we will, let me just ask this question. When's the last time you've been corrected? When's the last time you've been corrected? I'm a parent, many parents in here, correction is a big part of my life. you know, but somehow we think we just grow out of it. You know, like we mature out of that. Thank you very much. I'm no longer in school. No one's going to correct me anymore. And I was thinking about that, you know, because I think the reality is, is for many of us, it's been a long time since we've been corrected. And that could be for a number of different reasons. First reason, we don't need anybody to correct us. We got it all together right now. Okay. That could be the first one. And that may be true about you. The second thing is we don't have anyone around us that's willing to correct us right? 
which may be true as well. But the third one is really probably what I'm just gonna say is probably true about me. And that is I ain't open to anybody correcting me. I read scriptures that I like. I get people around me I like. I only look at stuff that I like. Come on. It's just human tendency. It's what Paul says. He wrote to Timothy and says, there's coming a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but instead they will gather around them teachers to say whatever their itching ears want to hear in order to suit their own desires. How many know that if you want to justify just about anything in life, you can find an expert on it. Just go to YouTube. Somebody is an expert on all kinds of folly, all right? You know, the, wor- the world's not, you know, it's flat. It's flat earth, it's this. Everybody's got an opinion. And you can find an expert on it. But that's not a safe place to be. I've been in many conversations with people where it gets heated and I just say, is it, are you open to being wrong? Is it possible? You might not be seeing this exactly accurate. And anytime they say, no, it's not, it's like the conversation's over. Like I'm happy to listen to and hear you, but we're really not working towards resolution. This is just combativeness, okay? So our job is really saying, you know, what is the standard and what needs to happen in my life to adjust to it? That's what examination is. That's why James says, don't be hearers only of God's word if it's gonna be the standard and deceive yourself, but instead do what it says. It's not enough to read the one year body, to read the verse of the day, because the verse of the day barely at any, at any time rarely ever tells me anything I don't wanna hear. You can do all things, you got this, you can be this, you can be that, right? Let me just say this, in Matthew chapter four, when, when Satan himself went to the desert to tempt Jesus, okay, when it says that Jesus was led to the wilderness to be tested, to be tempted by the devil, how Satan tempted Jesus is, is he, he used Bible verses. Satan uses Bible verses to tempt Jesus, and guess what? He probably uses Bible verses to tempt you. So we gotta understand not only the truth, but we have to submit ourselves to understanding the whole truth, and we have to give ourselves to it. Don't be hearers only of the word and deceive yourself, but do what it says. How many know it's not enough to come to a great church to hear a great preacher? I mean, you got a world-class preacher right here at this church. But it isn't gonna do anything in your life until something happens when you get in your car when you leave and you adjust to it. I gotta find that point on the ground. And here's the last point, and I'm gonna finish with this. There's safety in submission. There's safety in submission. Who are you running decisions by? Who do you have in your life who's saying, hey, I'm thinking about this, what do you think? You got anybody like that? You need them. I love that picture of the runner and he's got like the V formation in front of them, you know? It's like protecting and taking the wind and buffeting it, right? You need people like that in your life that I'm gonna be there. This is not alone. We're gonna have people around us. Be cautious of just getting people around you to think exactly how you think. Find somebody if you wanna grow spiritually. Here, here's a trick. Find somebody if you wanna grow spiritually that are where you wanna be spiritually and just get around them. Submit your life to them. What about a spiritual authority in your life? Do you have any spiritual authority in your life? Is there people in your life that you submit yourself to? And I know that this is, this seems so crazy because unfortunately so many times people abuse it, but I'm not talking about coming to this church. I'm saying you're in my life to point out the errors in my life. And when you see those errors and you speak to those errors and you tell me no, or you speak to those issues, I'm gonna submit my life to you. When I was 27 years old and me and my wife started dating, I went to my pastors, I went to my parents and I said, hey, you know, this woman is beautiful, but I wanna make sure that I'm seeing everything I need to see here. What do you think? Thankfully, they endorsed it and blessed it. When we got married, when I went to go get the ring, I went to her dad and say, I need your blessing in this. I went to my parents, I was 28 years old. I didn't, you know, I'm I'm a grown man. I can make my own decisions, but ultimately, You know, I know myself well enough to know that I can get myself into a whole lot of trouble. And I got blind spots. I say, what do you think about this? Do you got people in your life like that? 
You say, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm feeling, because honestly, I bump into people all the time that make major life altering decisions that don't have any counsel and advice in their life. It's just dangerous. I, don't, I try not to make any decision that's significant for Liberty Church. Let's deliberate about this. Let's talk about this. What do we feel about this? How do you feel about this? You get a consensus and let's move forward with it. Because, you know, not only am I, like, am I prone towards just being deceived, but I'm likely deceived many times. And my guess is, is so are you. Plans fail for lack of guidance, but there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Let's bow our heads if we can. Here's the prayer I want us to end on. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Verse 24, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. Let's pray that every day. Psalm 139, 23, search me, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any way in offensive way in me and lead me. Basically let's search me, test me, lead me. Search me, test me, lead me. If there's anything that's offensive, expose it and lead me to the way that I need to go. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here. I thank you that there are those here that, Lord, are maybe even in this moment, have their eyes open to some things that they've closed their eyes off to. And God, I pray that you would convict our hearts and our life. Don't bring condemnation, but you bring conviction into our heart to draw us to yourself and to change us. You don't cause us to walk, wallow around in shame. You bring us to life, God. For those of us that have, got, that have gotten off the mark and have wandered astray, God, I thank you that you stand here ready to receive us again and afresh in this moment, Lord. Help us to build guardrails in our life to build people around us where we have offered and willingly submitted to their counsel and their advice, people that will pray, people that care, and the people that know you, God, because there's safety in it, that we can walk in truth where you need us to go. Thank you for doing it. We thank you, Lord. Search me, God. Test me. See if there's any way that's offensive in me and lead me where you want me to go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, can we thank God for his word today?